All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for making it out today. Uh, today, we're excited to have Chris Cox from Iowa State University, who will be talking to us about the maximum number of paths and cycles in planar graphs. Go ahead and take us away, Chris. Yeah, well, well thanks, Drew. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some uh, recent work uh, with Ryan Martin. Um, that's exactly about what the uh, title says, trying to maximize the number of paths or cycles in a planar graph. So in general, uh, for graphs G and H, we can define N of G H to just be the number of copies of H and G. So here we're talking about unlabeled copies. And by a copy, I just mean legitimately a subgraph. I don't care if it's induced or not. So a clique has every graph on that number of vertices as a copy. And the actual question that we're interested in is a parameter called N sub curly P of N comma H which is the maximum number of copies of, of, of the graph H that can appear in an n-vertex planar graph. So the curly P here actually, uh, you know, talks about the num, uh, sorry, the curly P is just my notation for the set of all planar graphs. This is the same as the maximum of all the n of GHs, where G is an n-vertex planar graph. So this is just a parameter that we can study. And of course, the main question that I care about is the asymptotic of this function. So for various planar graphs H, what is the asymptotic of NP of NH as N goes to infinity? So what Chris, is the map? Yes. I have one question. NGH, uh, by the yes. copies you mean uh, just subgraphs. induced or just subgraph? Just subgraph. So the clique okay. has every graph on at most that many vertices as a copy. Also, Thanks. people can feel free to turn on their cameras. I, I don't know why everyone just went dark. Now I'm just talking to myself, but okay. I think yeah, sometimes so, we're a little bit worried that it's distracting or, you know, sometimes we don't want to be staring at our cameras all the time, kind of well, uh, move sure, around. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so here I, I just want to know how many copies of H can possibly appear in a planar graph. One thing, if I were to replace P with the set of all graphs, so now I'm just maximizing the number of copies of H in a graph, that's a silly question because the correct answer is however many copies of H appears in a clique. So we should restrict the family of graphs that we're actually looking at. All right, so let me tell you a bit about some previous results. Well, really the first graph, the first results on this, although it wasn't phrased in this way, really go back to Euler with the invention of planar graphs. Well, NP of NK2, that's just asking what is the maximum number of edges that can be in a planar graph? And this is well known to be about 3N. So one thing, I'm only caring about the asymptotics of this function. Yes, really, it's like 3N minus 6 or whatever, but I'm just going to care about the, mate, the leading term. Also, because K5 and K33 aren't planar, well, NP of those guys is just always zero. So those all just go back to Euler and anyone who's known anything about planar graphs knows these facts. But the actual study of this extremal function really goes back to Hakimi and Schmeichel in 1979, who are really concerned with how many copies of various cycle lengths can appear in planar graphs. So they said that the maximum number of triangles is asymptotic to 3n, and the maximum number of four cycles is asymptotic to n squared over two. A bit later, Alon and Caro actually generalized their four cycle result and were able to get uh, the maximum number of k2 k's uh, for k at least two. Also when k equals one, they were able to get it in which case k2 one is just the path on three vertices. I didn't write that result down though, mostly because I forgot. Uh, more recently, Wood was able to figure out the maximum number of K4s that can appear in a, in a planar graph. And just a couple years ago, Yuri and friends were able to figure out the maximum number of paths on four vertices and the maximum number of five cycles. So these were two different papers that were put out about two years ago. Um, one thing that I should mention, I'm only caring about uh, asymptotics here, but all of the results up to this point there are actually exact answers, um, but I'm only uh, recalling the asymptotics, but these numbers are known exactly. And just last year, Goshen friends were able to figure out the maximum number of P5s in a planar graph. And this is the first result that actually it is asymptotic. They did not 
figure this out exactly. Um, so they, this is actually just an asymptotic result that they got. And they had a conjecture of what should happen for all odd paths, so paths on an odd number of vertices. And they conjecture that this should be 4n times n over n to the n plus 1, whatever that means. I'll, I'll explain uh, briefly where this comes from in a bit. And this is really the starting point of Ryan and my work, um, trying to figure out this conjecture. So what happens for odd paths on odd numbers of vertices? So let's talk about that a bit. So our results, talking about paths on an odd, numbers of vert on an odd number of vertices, first off, we verify the conjecture of Gaussian friends for the, six, for the seven path. Namely, if you plug things into their formula, you would get four over 27 times n to the fourth. And that's indeed what we were able to prove. For all other odd length paths, we were able to significantly improve the upper bound. So one thing that I should mention is that the order of magnitude here, so n to the n plus one, is actually an easy result that I'm sure that any of you could sit down and prove in a couple of minutes. It's, it's very simple to get the actual order of magnitude of this function. So we're really fighting for the leading constants. And in fact, uh, in your proof where you would actually get, say, the order of magnitude, uh, you would probably prove a, con a leading constant of something like 6 to the n, which is pretty bad. So we're able to actually bring that down to n to the m plus 1 over about m factorial, which is pretty great. So as I said, um, Ryan, and I Ryan, eh, Ryan and my motivation was just this conjecture about odd paths. But as we were working, we figured out that actually these same ideas apply to even cycles. In fact, the ideas apply to a much more broad class of graphs uh, if we want to actually compute this parameter, but I'll just leave it at even cycles and odd paths for the sake of this talk. So when it comes to even cycles, if you remember, uh, Hakimi and Schmeichel already figured out the four cycle. So we figured out the next two cases, namely six cycles and eight cycles. And again, significantly improved the upper bound for even cycles in general. Again, the order of magnitude of n to the m is actually very simple, and any of you could prove it quickly. But again, the constant you would probably get out of your silly proof is really awful. Again, it would be something like 6 to the m, probably. And in fact, uh, we have a conjecture. I'll attribute it to us, not because I think that we're the only ones who've thought of it, but because I haven't seen it in the literature, that this pattern that we see for six cycles and eight cycles should continue for all 2m cycles. So the answer for the maximum number of cycles on 2m vertices should be n over m to the m. Now, where is this actually coming from is the following construction. Let's start with an m cycle, so vertices 1, 2, 3, et cetera, up to m, and now take each edge and blow it up into an independent set of size n over m and connect all the vertices uh, that you just blew up to both of the endpoints of the original edge. So now if we want to actually count 2m cycles, well, we first lay down every other vertex at the vertices of the original cycle. And now for all of the intermediate vertices, we have n over m choices for each of those. So we have n about n over m to the m, uh, 2m cycles in this construction. And you can quickly verify that this is in fact a planar graph. I've drawn it. Um, one interesting thing, oh, in fact, this is the exact construction that gives the lower bound of the conjecture of Gaussian friends. So that silly number of like 4m, whatever, it, they think that this is also the asymptotic extremal example for paths on an odd number of vertices as well. Um, one thing I should notice about this uh, construction is it's not a maximal planar graph. It only has about 2n edges instead of 3n edges. So it's a bit weird that you know we're missing out on n edges that we could possibly still add to this construction. But asymptotically, it doesn't matter at all. 
this is really the base structure. Um, one more thing that I'll mention about all of our results before uh, I tell you a bit about the ideas behind how to prove them is that instead of dealing with planar graphs, it doesn't matter. None of our results care that the graph is at, that the host graph is actually planar. All we care about is that it has linearly many edges. which planar graphs do, they have th at most three n edges, but in fact, any linear number of edges is okay. And there's no legitimate copy of K33. So planar graphs have no subdivided copy of K33 or a topological K33, but we're not even taking advantage of that fact. We're just going to take advantage of the fact that legitimately there is no actual copy of K33 in all of our results. So these are very broad. Should ask if there are any questions before I go on. Okay. Um, so as I said, we were really motivated by the question of odd paths, but I actually wanna first tell you about how to get say the six cycle. I wanna walk you through a sketch of this proof, mostly because, well, turns out that even cycles are easier than odd paths um, in many regards. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to sketch for you a proof of the maximum number of C6s in a planar graph and really harp on the main ideas behind this. All right. So we'll start by fixing a planar graph G on N vertices. And I want to get a bound on the number of copies of C6 that can appear in this graph. Well, let's look at a C6. I'll, I'll draw one right here. So we have our lovely six vertices. Great. And let's pick three of these vertices to be, I'll, I'll call them anchors. So we have some X, some Y, and some Z. Now imagine that we were to lay down these, six, these three vertices inside of G and ask how many ways are there to complete those three vertices, those anchor vertices to a six cycle? Well, all I have to do is figure out how many choices there are for each of these vertices right here. Well, this vertex has to be adjacent to both X and Y. So the number of choices is the co-degree of X and Y in G. So I'll write just degree of x comma y to denote the co-degree of two vertices. So the number of common neighbors that they have. Same thing here. This has to be adjacent to both z and x. So they're at most degree of z and x choices. And this one has to be adjacent to both y and z. In other words, we can write down a quick and dirty bound for this guy, namely, will sum over all triples x, y, z in the vertices of g, choose three, of the number of ways to complete those three vertices to a six cycle like this. So it's the co-degree of x and y times the co-degree of y and z times the co-degree of z and x. And really, if we wanted to, we could divide this by two because there are two choices for the three anchor vertices. They could either be these three vertices or they could be these three vertices. We've, we've counted each six cycle twice. So we could divide by two if we really want to. All right. Now this alone is enough to get the order of magnitude. If you just play with this expression and use the fact that planar graphs, the sum of the degrees is at most six n, you'll easily get the right order of magnitude, but getting the leading constant is a bit more tricky. So in order to actually get the leading constant, we need to use two big ideas. So idea number one, idea number one is to partition the vertices of G into two sets. So the first set I'll call big, and the second set I'll call small. Well, what is big? Big is the set of all vertices that have very large degrees. So let's say that 
their degree is at least epsilon m, where you can think about epsilon as a very, very tiny uh, but fixed constant. So that's why big is much smaller than small, at least in this picture, simply because th since there are only linearly many edges, the size of big is about you know one over epsilon, order one over epsilon. So the size of the number of big degree vertices is about constant, whereas small is about everything else. All right, okay, I've partitioned my vertices like this. And now the idea is to show that almost every six cycle actually alternates between big and small. So in other words, almost every single six cycle looks like this. It has three vertices in big and three vertices in small. Any six cycle which you know does anything else, there are very, very few of them. So essentially every six cycle is controlled by the big degree vertices. Well, if we go back to this picture, that means that I can count six cycles, at least asymptotically, by only considering these anchor vertices inside of the big set. So in other words, we can bound NGC6 asymptotically by the sum over triples x, y, z, but now that are just big vertices of the same thing. So degree of x comma y, co-degree of y and z, co-degree of z and x. One thing I should notice is that we do not get this factor of a half anymore because there's only one, this only counts, uh, each six cycle is only counted once because it's only counted by putting the anchors on the big degree vertices. Okay, well, I'm very happy, at least with this reduction right now, because before we were summing over n choose three different things. So n cube different things, but now the size of big is constant so we're summing over only a constant number of things. Already, I think that this is a great improvement. So we only care about actually anchoring our C6s on the big degree vertices. And now idea number two comes in. And idea number two says that the co-neighborhoods of uh, vertices in big. So if I look at all of the co-neighborhoods between big degree vertices, they are asymptotically disjoint. So there are very, very few vertices that are in more than one co-neighborhood of big degrees. In other words, what our graph really looks like, at least up to approximation, is we have a constant number of big degree vertices, and in between them are living a bunch of small degree vertices in these kind of, well, Ryan and I like to call them tumors. And if you notice this type of structure, is exactly what popped up when I was telling you, you know, our conjecture for what should happen for even cycles, is that you have a cycle where you kind of blow up each edge into a bunch of vertices. Okay, well, we're making uh, some pretty good pro progress. Let's do the following. Yeah. Let's define a function mu of x, y to be the co-degree of x and y divided by n. So mu is a function on big choose two. We're only going to consider co-degrees between big vertices. And mu is asymptotically because the co-neighborhoods of the vertices in big are asymptotically disjoint, that means that if I add up all the co-degrees, it's at most n plus a little bit. 
So dividing by n, that says that if I add up all of the mu of x, y's, I'm getting about one. So mu is asymptotically a sub probability. I'll put sub in quotes. It's a probability mass. on big choose two. And this is all because the uh, co-neighborhoods of big degree vertices are asymptotically disjoint. So let's rewrite this bound in terms of mu. If we rewrite this bound, we get that n of g comma c6 is asymptotically at most the sum over x, y, z in big choose three. of mu of x, y, mu of y, z, mu of z, x, all multiplied by n cubed to take care of the dividing by n for each of the mu's. Well, this is fantastic. This tells me that now if I just want to bound this guy, that this is at most the supremum. And I'll tell you over what in a second, over x, y, z in capital X choose three, where capital X is just some set, mu of x, y, mu of y, z, mu of z, x times n cubed, where the supremum is taken over capital X, a finite set, and mu, a probability mass on x choose two. So in other words, if we want to get an upper bound, at least asymptotic upper bound on the maximum number of copies of C6, well, the n cubed is already there. That's the right order of magnitude. And this will be the constant out in front of it, the supremum of this, uh, this optimization problem on probability masses. Now let's talk a little bit about this function. Well, mu is a probability mass on, you can think about it as x is just some vertex set, and mu is a probability mass on the clique that has those vertices, meaning that's x choose two. And what is this expression? Well, this expression right here, if we were to write it down, it's a constant, which is pretty easy to compute. I think it's like one six in this case, of the probability that if we sample independently three edges according to the distribution mu, that they form a triangle. So in other words, what we're really asking is, I'm going to allow you to put some probability distribution on the edges of a clique. And I want to maximize the probability that if I sample independently three different edges, that they actually form a triangle. And I want to know which is the best probability mass for this. Are there any questions so far? No. OK. So again, let's bear this in mind. I want to maximize the probability that three edges sampled independently. So it may be that I pick the same edge three times. They're completely independent samples that they form a triangle. So let me just give you, uh, let, let me just call this a name. I'll just call it beta mu and I'll call it C3 because again, we're looking for triangles. This will just be this definition X, Y, Z in capital X choose three, mu of X, Y, mu, Y, Z, mu, Z, X. All right, and now our goal is to show that the supremum of the beta mu C3s is at most one third because again, that is the constant that we're gunning for. We want to show that it's n cubed divided by three cubed. Okay, well, one thing that you can notice with this, if you think about it for a moment, 
is that this is the exact answer that you would get if you took the uniform distribution on just the edges of a triangle to start with. So in other words, we're trying to show that if I want to maximize the probability of actually getting a triangle, then I should just take the uniform distribution on the edges of a triangle to start with. So that's what we're going to try to argue. So let me show you why this is true. All right, so let's start, let's fix an optimal mu. And let's suppose that it has minimum support. So it gives, you know, uh, very few edges have positive mass. Now you should go, wait, 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 Chris, what do you mean optimal mu? This is a supremum. How do you know the supremum exists? Um, there is a way to argue that the supremum exists, uh, but that's actually not necessary to do the rest of this proof. You can use a silly little trick to get around this fact. But let's ignore that for a moment and pretend that the supremum does indeed exist, and therefore we can fix a mu that achieves the supremum, just to make our lives easier. All right. So we have at our disposal an optimal mu, and its support is as small as possible. So let's define what I call the support graph of mu, which I'll just denote by g sub mu. And the support graph is exactly kind of how it sounds. Mu is a probability mass on the edges of a clique. So g mu, its edge set, is precisely the support of mu. And its vertex set is, you know, whatever, whatever uh, vertices those edges span. In other words, g mu is just telling us which edges actually have a positive probability of being sampled. Okay. So I have the following claim about g mu. And the claim is that every pair of edges in G mu are contained in a common triangle in G mu. In other words, if I give you any pair of edges that have positive mass under mu, then there's a triangle which contains them which also has positive mass. So there's always some way to pick a triangle that uses this pair of edges, no matter which pair I give you. The, uh, the astute among you will notice that if we can prove this, we're basically done, but I'll leave that for a moment. All right, so why is this true? Well, let's define something. So for an edge, let's say xy, let's define the function t of xy to be the sum over all vertices z, which are not x or y, of mu of xz times mu of yz. So if we think that about this in probabilistic language, this is essentially a conditional probability. It's the probability of picking a triangle conditioned on already having picked the edge xy. This is the probability of completing the edge xy into a triangle, essentially, up to a constant. All right, so for the actual problem, let's suppose not. Suppose that E and S aren't in a common triangle. So E and S both have positive mass. They're in the support but they're not in a common triangle of G mu. If that's the case, then we can rewrite beta of mu C3 in the following way. Let's first look at all of the triangles which actually use E. Well, those would give us mu of E times T of E. Okay, plus mu of S, T of S. Now notice that we haven't overcounted because by assumption, any triangle which contains both E and S has zero mass. There's no chance of picking it. 
So we only have to worry about triangles that are actually triangles in GMU. So these are the ones that use E, these are the ones that use S, and then there's, I'll just call it the rest, triangles that use neither E nor S. Sure. All right. Well, we'll log, we can assume that T of E is at least T of S. Fine, no big deal. And let's define a new probability mass, which we'll call mu prime. And mu prime simply says move the mass on the edge S to E. So literally E the mass of E under mu prime is the mass of E and plus the mass of S under mu, and S now has no mass on it under mu prime. Well, let's see what happens if we compute beta of mu prime C3. Well, this is, well, first we look at all the triangles that contain E. Well, the new mass of E is mu of E plus mu of S. And because S and E were never in a common triangle, this T of E function stays the same. It, it doesn't know whether it's under mu or mu prime. All right, plus the triangles with Jews S are now zeroed out because S now has no mass. And then plus the rest. And this is the same rest as above because again, we've only changed the mass on E and on S. And the rest were triangles that use neither of those. But now we use the fact that T of E is at least T of S. So we get at least mu of E times T of E plus mu of S T of S plus the rest. Ah, but that's exactly beta of mu C3. But that's a contradiction because we started by saying that mu was an optimal mass with minimum support but we just constructed a new mass mu prime, which does at least as well as mu, but has strictly smaller support because, well, we moved all of the mass from S to E. So mu prime has one fewer edge in its support. So this shows us that every pair of edges in the support graph must be contained in a common triangle in the support graph. Are there any questions? Okay, well now we're basically done because there's only one graph that has this property. If every pair of edges are contained in a common triangle, then the graph must be a triangle. I mean, possibly there are isolated vertices, but because we only care about edges, this just says that G mu is a triangle. Let's say that the triangle has vertices X, Y, and Z. But now, if we compute it, beta mu C3, which is the best one, this is equal to, well, there's only one triangle. So when we sum over the triangle, it's just mu of xy, mu of yz, mu of zx, apply the amgm inequality, And now it's a probability mass, so the top adds up to one. And there's our proof. So if we go all the way back, we've shown, where did it go? Now I'm losing all my pages. Okay, I don't know where it went. But this says the maximum number of copies of C6 is asymptotically at most, we said, it was the supremum over mu of beta mu C3 times n cubed. And this is n cubed over 3 cubed, just as we wanted. All right. So this idea works for any even cycle, namely NP of n c 2 m this corresponds to the function beta of mu c m 
where this is exactly what you'd think, this is some constant which can be computed times the probability that if you sample m edges independently from the probability mass mu, that they form a copy of an m cycle. So in other words, if I want to figure out this extremal problem for the 2m cycle, I actually just need to understand this optimization question for the m cycle. Namely, which mass maximizes the probability that if I sample m independent edges from it, they form a cycle. So our conjecture is that beta of mu cm is at most 1 over m to the m. In other words, uh, it's maximized. by uh, the uniform distribution on the edges of CM. So far, we only have a proof for M equals three. That's the one I just showed you. We can also do it for M equals four, uh, but it's uh, more involved. So in other words, that's why we get the six cycle and the eight cycle. I think that it should be easy to get uh, this beta of mu C5 and C6, because in order to get the four cycle, we had to prove a number of structural results on this uh, mass. And essentially with those things, you should be able to get it, but I, I don't know how to get those two. But it gets more and more difficult as M gets larger and larger. Um, right. So one thing that I'll quickly mention is that um, there was nothing really special about cycles. What was really important is that C2M is the one subdivision of CM. So if I subdivide each edge once of CM, I get a C2M. And this general idea about relating this, uh, this extremal problem to an optimization problem over probability masses really works for any graph that's formed by a one subdivision. There are some restrictions, uh, but generally, you can uh, phrase this uh, correspondence for about any graph that looks like a subdivision. Are there questions? Okay. Nope. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so I now want to actually tell you a little bit about paths. So if I bring back up our results on paths, we actually got the right answer for uh, the seven path. And we used a very similar idea. I want to give you an idea of you know, the slight difference between paths and cycles. And I don't want to prove our P7 result because it's somewhat complicated, but I do want to reprove the result of Goshen friends who proved uh, the asymptotic answer for the number of paths on five vertices. So this is very different than their proof, and it uses the same ideas for our cycles. So let's prove, at least sketch a proof, that the maximum number of P5s in a planar graph is at most n cubed asymptotically. So this is Gaussian. All right. So we're going to start by doing a very similar idea with the anchor vertices. So if we were to draw a P5, here's a P5 right here. Well, if I anchor these two vertices, X and Y, and count how many ways there are to extend this to a five path, well, there are co-degree of X and Y, many choices for this guy, degree of X, many choices here, and degree of Y, many choices here. So we can bound n of g p5 by we sum over all pairs x and y in v choose 2 of degree of x, the co-degree of x and y times the degree of y. And we get to divide by 2 because um, there are two orderings on this path. Oh, sorry. 
I want to sum over just x not equal to y, let's say. That way I can divide by two. Okay, so in V. So now we apply our two ideas. So again, we partition into big and small, and we show that almost every single P5 has these two anchor vertices in the big degree vert in the big set. So almost every single P5 looks like this. So automatically, we can improve the bound to say asymptotically at most, the sum over x not equal to y, but now in big, I get to divide by two, I apologize, degree of x, degree of x comma y times degree of y. Note that here I actually get to maintain this factor of two because there are still two different paths I get. I get the same path if I pick this vertex first and then second, as I would if I pick them in the opposite order. And now we apply our second big idea, which is that these co-neighborhoods are almost disjoint. And actually we need a little bit more that says that, well, these guys don't live in co-neighborhoods. These are just literally the degrees of the vertices X and Y. So we need to do a little bit more effort to say that actually the graph really does look like this blow up structure. So that the graph actually has this type of structure as opposed to having some vertex that has a bunch of just little vertices hanging off of it. That's a bit more of an argument, but it's doable. So what we'll wind up getting is that the maximum number of P5s can be asymptotically bounded above by the following. Again, because they're disjoint, we're going to change degrees into some probability mass. So we'll sum over x not equal to y in some set x of, and I'll define these in a moment, mu bar of x times mu of xy times mu bar of y times, in this case, n cubed over 2, because we divide it by n three times, so we get an n cubed. Where again, the supremum is just over x is a finite set and mu is a probability mass on x choose two. And now the only term I haven't told you what it means is this guy right here. Well, this is the weighted degree of a vertex. If I think about the probability mass as being weights on the edges of a clique, mu bar is the weighted degree. So this is the sum over all y not equal to x of mu of xy. In other words, if I think about it, if I sample an edge from the probability distribution mu, mu bar of x is the probability that that edge is incident to the vertex x. All right, so if we actually want, are there questions about, I, I know I didn't tell you too many details, but the details are roughly the same, slightly more complicated than for cycles. But we again get down to this optimization question over probability masses. So now our goal is to show that for any probability mass mu, the sum over x not equal to y of mu bar of x, mu of xy, mu bar of y, that this is at most two because then that two cancels that two, and we get the correct asymptotic result of just one times n cubed. Well, how can we prove this? Well, let's define a matrix. So in capital X. All right, so mu, mu is some probability mass on you know, the edges of a clique, some x choose two. Let's define a matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by x, where the xy coordinate is just the mass between x and y. And we'll say where, we'll just say that mu of x, x is zero. So the diagonal entries of m are zeros. All right. So we're going to make a few observations. One, m is non-negative. 
I mean, its entries are either zero or some number between zero and one. Two, it's symmetric. simply because the probability mass doesn't have an ordering on it. It's just the probability mass of the edge. And three, its row sums are all at most one, simply because the row sums of the M matrix are precisely the mu of the mu bars, which are just a probability. A row sum is just the probability that an edge is incident to that vertex. Okay. Well, number one and number three together tell me that the maximum eigenvalue of M is at most one. It's a non-negative matrix, all of whose row sums are at most one, so its max eigenvalue is as well. And the symmetric component, this tells me that I know something about the Rayleigh quotient, namely, this guy is at most lambda max times the inner product of X with itself. Well, and lambda max is at most one. So if I take the inner product of over M, so X inner product MX, that's at most the inner product of X with itself. So now we rewrite this thing. Mu bar of X, mu of XY, mu bar of Y. And by rewriting it and thinking about mu bar as a vector, I mean, it's a function from capital X to R, so it's a vector indexed by X. This is precisely the inner product of the vector mu bar with M times mu bar, which is now at most the inner product of mu bar with itself. And if we just write what this means, this is the sum over all X, mu bar of X squared. But now mu bar is a probability, so it's at most one, so I can just delete the squared and only get bigger. And the final question is, what is the sum of the mu bars? Well, mu bar is a degree. And the handshaking lemma tells me that the sum of the degrees is twice the sum of the edges. I mean, in this weighted sense, the sum of the weights of the degrees, of the weighted degrees is twice the sum of the weighted edges but the edges are a probability mass, which is one. So the sum of the mu bars by the handshaking lemma is two. So we have in fact proved exactly what we needed to. All right. So generally, so I want to reiterate generally, N, P, N, C, 2, M corresponds to the question of maximize the probability that if you sample edges E1 through EM from some probability distribution, that they form an M cycle, so a copy of CM. We can actually redo everything that we did with P5 to show that NP of N and then here P2M plus one, this corresponds to maximize the following function. So the sum over all X1 not equal to XM of mu bar of X1 times mu of X1, X2 mu of xm minus one, mu of xm, mu bar of xm, overall mu. Uh, this expression is slightly more difficult to actually write down as a clean probability like this, um, but it, it can be written as a probabilistic event. It's just these mu bars kind of make it a bit difficult to describe or, or more just not very enlightening to describe. And these are wide open pretty much. So again, all we know is this one is good for, well, technically we can do it when M is two. So we'll say two, three and four. And this one is only good when M is either uh, two or three, but they're wide open otherwise. 
one thing that I'll mention is that this problem is significantly easier than this problem. For instance, I say maximize here. Really, it's a supremum over all probability masses. In this question, I can prove that the supremum is actually achieved. So it's literally a maximum. In this problem, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea how to even prove that the supremum is even achieved. And essentially, the entire difficulty comes from the dangly leaves. The fact that these mu bars show up make things very, very difficult. And I have no good way around it. So at least when M is, say, five or six for the cycle question, uh, you I mean, if you had a computer program that could do nonlinear optimization really well, you could solve this problem. But even if you had a computer that could do nonlinear optimization well, I don't know how you'd even start to solve this problem simply because I have no idea how many edges should even be in play. It could be that infinitely many edges, you know, that there is no supremum and hence you keep getting better and better and better as, I ha as you have more and more edges. I don't believe that to be the case, but it technically could be. All right, so I'll end there. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Chris. Uh, if we could all thank our speaker in some way, and then we'll go ahead and open it up for, for some questions. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so you steered completely around it, but I'm guessing you're completely aware that you just did a bunch of like graph on maximization problems, right? The number of triangles was like you're maximizing the number of triangles in a graph on. The, well, I mean, well, you mean? say graph on, but we're in a very sparse setting. Yeah. Right. So aren't the graph ons trivial when you're in this? Because all of our results apply to only when you're graph. So again, planar never mattered throughout all of this. It was only linearly many edges and no legitimate copy of K33. But don't graph ons require you to have n squared edges to even exist and not be trivial? Well, I mean, so there are these sparse graph models with like linearly many edges, but, okay. and so maybe it fits into that paradigm, but also like the, I mean, this question about the, what you have written there with the CMs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's over any mu or? Uh, any, so all I'm saying, so the mu here is just a probability mass on X choose two. Um, where x is just some finite set. x is some finite set. Yes. So this mu, it, this mu is a graph on. That's true. That's yeah. Yeah. So the mu itself is a graph on. Absolutely. I mean, I I know essentially nothing about graph ons, but the mu is a graph on. Yes. So, wait, so how is this not just maximizing? And I mean, of course, there's all this like run up and pinning down the structure before you can use the optimization. But at, uh, well, that so one How's thing it? is that, well, I, I don't know if this, again, I don't know anything about graph ons. So let, let me preface it with this. One, the one thing that might make it not a graph on is the fact that this X is literally finite. So I, I say that the mu is a graph on, but it's in some sense not really, because it's important that the vertex set is actually finite here. And that all of the examples that we believe actually optimize this do have finitely many vertices. So you're not going to get better as you get more and more vertices, which may actually hinder you representing this as a graph on. I mean, in some sense it still is because I can take step functions, right? Uh, but I don't know the right way to think about that. The other thing that's important here that I think actually makes this, well, I don't know, again, you tell me because I don't know about graph ons, is that one thing that could happen here when I select these M edges is that I may have picked the same edge twice. 
in which case I will never form a copy of CM. Because, well, a CM on every edge is only picked once, right? Every edge is multiplicity one. And I have a feeling that, uh, well, I, I don't really know with the graph on model if you could represent this cleanly. Possibly you could, but I, I don't actually know. In the, in the limit, these, these kinds of, you know, the event that you pick something twice ends up not mattering. Yeah. The main issue though, is that in some sense, this mu is not a limit object because we're actually gunning for a mu that is very finite because this probability, I conjecture that it's optimized by the uniform distribution on the edges of CM itself, right? So I, I don't know what the what limit object there even is. Yeah, another way to avoid the graph is uh, think about it's a, uh, a line graph, and they consider the maximum Lagrangian. Uh, the maximum what? Uh, Lagrangian, the Lagrangian of the. Uh, well, it's just a vertex edge weighted sum equal to one. So uh, mm -hmm. if you consider the Lagrangian of the graph and uh, maybe you can apply that. But is it this, because if I'm in a line graph, a triangle in a line graph, well, uh, an M still, cycle still a triangle, graph huh? doesn't correspond to an actual M cycle, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't because I may have revisited mm. the same vertices when I pull it back to the original graph. Yeah, I think so. You, probably you have to like condition if we this some uh, subgraph or something. Yeah, probably. Mm. I, I don't yeah. actually know. I haven't thought about them as line graphs. Mm. Um, again, this is a very general problem, as I mentioned for this guy right here. I can really replace C2M by any subdivision of a graph provided that mm -hmm. it's like minimum degree is at least three or two, two or three. And then basically, so I, I have a one subdivision of some graph that doesn't have dangly leaves like the path does. Then again, we're trying to maximize picking a bunch of edges that they form a copy of the graph that we actually subdivided. This is an interesting question because, well, you might uh, conjecture that the right answer for if I want to maximize the probability of getting a copy of H, that the right thing to do is to take the uniform distribution on the edges of H. That's not actually correct for, for infinitely many graphs H. I, I have lots of counterexamples. Um, but for cycles, I think it is true. And again, we can prove it uh, for three and four. Technically, this problem is very slightly different when M is two, because what, what do I mean by a two cycle here? It's really, I want to maximize the probability that when I pick two edges, I actually pick the same edge. So that's what I mean by a two cycle, which is clearly optimized by literally only having one edge in your support. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Josh, yeah, sorry. I. I know essentially nothing about graphons. Um, the main thing that I would be saying for why, in some sense, mu is a graphon because I could think about there being infinitely many vertices, but at least for every, every one of the problems that fit into this situation, I can prove that the supremum is achieved by something on not too many vertices. Um, so there are not very many vertices in all of these. Maybe like uh, the number of vertices is, I don't know, like twice the number of edges is like a strict upper bound, say. I don't remember what exactly I can prove. And for the paths, for odd paths, I can't prove the supremum exists, but again, the conjectured answer for this guy, what is the maximum here? Uh, the conjecture that we have is that this is actually maximized again by uniform on the edges of an M cycle. That this, uh, that this um, thing is optimized by uniform on the edges of an M cycle. Again, we can prove this for two and three. Um, but if these are indeed the optimizers, then I don't know what graphons would have to say about it because there's no real limit object here. But perhaps I just don't know enough to say anything. Yeah, I guess I, my, my mental picture was having X, the set, um, grow without bound. 
and then you've got a uh, yeah but it the but whole then, point here is that theoretically x could grow grow without bound right mm -hmm. because in our reduction step the epsilon needed to go to zero so your number of big vertices may tend toward infinity mm -hmm. um so theoretically the x could grow without bound the kind of point is that um in, in what we're saying is that if the X grows without bound, actually what happens is that most of those vertices are just isolated. They're not incident to any edge that has mass. Your entire mass is concentrated on some finite subgraph. Um, that should be what's going on. In, in, in these problems, it is going on. In this problem, I have no idea, but I suspect that it's also going on, but I just don't have any idea on how to prove it. But I'm not going to discourage you from trying to think of it, find out a different way to think about this. Um, I just don't have any idea how graphons help. Yeah, the, the sparseness is making it so that the limit as the size of the x goes infinity is irrelevant. Yeah. Um, another thing is that maybe I should point out is that this mu uh, has nothing to do with planarity, right? It's literally an arbitrary probability mass on the edges of a cleave. Where we started with, you know, linearly many edges, this mu in its support graph may have all of the edges having positive mass. Who knows? Um, but again, the thought is that taking taking the ground set to be larger and larger and larger doesn't help you. You should really and and again, actually, this makes sense. I mean, if I had a mu that was actually spreading out all of its mass. But I want to maximize the probability that if I pick a bunch of edges, it forms a particular subgraph. Well, if mu spreads out all of its mass, then I'm going to pick these edges to be really far away from one another. I'm, I have no chance of forming this finite, this like very compressed object. So that kind of gives you an intuition on why mu shouldn't spread mass out everywhere, that it really should concentrate on some small part. I mean, if you're curious more about like what's actually going on in these functions, the paper is on archive where we do a lot more than, than what I talked about and, and study these types of functions more in depth. Um, if you want to take a look. And, and maybe there's something there if you see not my hand waving nonsense when talking about this, maybe you can get a better idea. But I'm great at uh, hand waving nonsense. Uh, do we have any other questions for Chris? Okay, if not, thanks again, Chris, and thanks everybody for, for making it out, and have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah, well, thanks Thank for having you. me. Bye-bye.